Hi, welcome to More Christ. Today I'm joined by the marvelous Dr. Michael J. Gorman. Michael is an American New Testament scholar and the Raymond D. Brown Professor of Biblical Studies and Theology at St. Mary's Univ Seminary and University. Michael specializes especially in the letters, theology, and spirituality of the Apostle Paul. He's associated with the participationist perspective on Paul's theology. His additional specialities are the Book of Revelation, theological and missional interpretation of scripture, the gospel of John and early Christian ethics. So just to begin then, Michael, um, can you tell us a bit about your background and some of the key events in your life that have helped to form you and to your love for Christ? Yes, certainly, Mark. Thank you so much for having me. And, and thank you to your uh, listeners and viewers for allowing me to have uh, some time in, in your space. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I, I was certainly brought up in a situation of um, caring, loving parents who were Christians, but I it, it never really took with me. Um, and it finally did take with me, if you will, through the influence of um, people my own age when I was in high school. So I got very involved in a Methodist youth group and uh, eventually in uh, a ministry here in in the Maryland area where I live in, in the United States called Young Life. So I had those kinds of influences as a teenager and uh, went to a small um, Christian college. So began to really begin thinking uh, and not only trying to act, but think Christianly. I was uh, strongly influenced in my early years by um, one particular youth minister who then went on to be ordained as a, as a Methodist pastor. And we've remained friends all these years. I was also very much influenced early on in my Christian walk with, um, by people who um, I'm still in contact with to this day. And matter of fact, a couple of them still uh, are in a Bible study that I'm part of. So those kinds of influences have been important for, for a very, very long time. Um, there, are, there are other more academic influences as well but uh, that's, you know, kind of my early background. Yeah, marvelous. And what then um, first prompted your interest in St. Paul or the Apostle Paul and this participation perspective and the central concerns that have developed in your work? Yeah, well, um, none of that kind of came instantly at any particular time. I remember when I was in college, I was a French student, French major, we say in the United States, um, but I did biblical languages and New Testament as my as my secondary field, and I was assisting a professor in the teaching of uh, a course on Romans. So I got a little bit of an interest in in Paul from that. But early on in my in my life in Christ, I was struck by the text in Colossians that says, um, you know, that your your life is in Christ and your hope is in Christ, and Christ in you, the hope of glory. That stuck with me. And so now in retrospect, I realized I was thinking about participation way early in my life, but not even thinking about it in any kind of academic way. I did a lot of study of Paul when I was a, a seminary student, an MDiv student, and then early in my PhD career. In the United States, you have to take seminars before you do the research. And at the end of those seminars, I finally began to land on a topic. I was interested in, in Paul's ethics. And it was in exploring his ethics in connection with some ancient writers that I began to see what later became for me the two main themes of my work in Paul, cruciformity or cross-shaped living and participation being in Christ. So a lot of those took shape in my, in my dissertation research and, and writing, um, but then they developed over the years, especially as I was in dialogue with uh, some key scholars who influenced me, particularly Richard Hayes. So that's, that was kind of the genesis of, of these things. They, they all developed over time, of course, but that was the, the beginning, if you will. Yeah, marvelous. And I think he's brilliant too. He's one of my favorites. And yeah. um, what is it like then to be a Methodist, as I understand, in a predominantly Catholic college? And how does, does that um, speak to some of your concerns, say, for church unity and how Christians should dialogue? Yeah, yeah. Well, um, St. Mary's Seminary and University in Baltimore is a really interesting place. Uh, it's the oldest Catholic seminary in the United States. It goes back to 1791. And 
it is, as far as we know, the only Catholic seminary in the world that has a graduate ecumenical division. So it's unique in the Catholic world. It's unique in theological education. There are schools that aren't Catholic seminaries um, that have programs for or even divisions for more ecumenical activity, but a Catholic seminary with an ecumenical division is, is unique. Um, and it's deliberately so. It was founded, the ecumenical division was founded in 1968, right after the Second Vatican Council. So there's always been a strong interest at St. Mary's in ecumenical and also interfaith relations. So it's, it's part of the DNA of the institution now has been for more than 50 years, 50, mm -hmm. 53 years. And so uh, when I first came to St. Mary's, which was a long time ago, 1991, so I've been there now 30 years, uh, I was hired only to teach as a part-time faculty member in the ecumenical division, but they had, I believe at the time, two or three Protestants in the Catholic division. And due to a variety of circumstances, a half-time position opened up in the Catholic seminary in New Testament and a half-time position opened up as associate dean of the ecumenical division. And I was there at the right place at the right time. And the two were joined together, that was in 1993. And I've been full-time in both divisions ever since in one capacity or another. Yeah, so, marvelous. And it's it's great. It's, the, it's interesting you asked that question. For me, it's, it's fine. I, I have a lot of, for a lot of reasons, have a lot of Catholic sensibilities. Um, a lot of overlap theologically and lots of other ways. But uh, some of the seminarians occasionally can be a little bit um, wary. Uh, what is a, a Protestant doing teaching here? And, uh, and then they get to know me and they realize uh, that I'm nothing to be afraid of and that I actually <laughs> reinforce a lot of their uh, concerns, especially because a lot of my interests, even in Paul, uh, diverge a bit from traditional Protestant, at least allegedly traditional Protestant readings of Paul. Yeah, marvelous. And um, I want to take it back to Richard Hayes, if we may, and sure. any others who've inspired you over the years or that have been particularly influential. Um, I want to ask why and how have they, people like uh, Richard moved you so much and what's so interesting about their work? Yeah. Well, I first encountered Richard Hayes when I was writing my dissertation. I encountered an article that he had written and then his, his, his own dissertation. And I was blown away by the insights that I thought he had in, into Paul. And they resonated with what I was doing very much. I was developing a narrative approach to Paul and I found that in Richard Hayes. I was developing a close connection between Christology and ethics. And I found that in embryonic form in Hayes even before he wrote his famous moral vision of the New Testament. Mm -hmm. um, so I resonated with his work while I was doing my own research early on. And as my own more narrative and Christological um, perspectives developed, I found myself more and more in sync with Richard and we became uh, fast friends. As soon as his moral vision book came out, I invited him to come give some lectures at St. Mary's and we hit it off and have remained close friends uh, now for more than 25 years. At the same time, about the same time, I was introduced to Tom Wright. And um, so I said, well, I'm gonna have uh, Tom Wright come to, to give some lectures. I was Dean at the time, so I could invite whoever I wanted to come give lectures. So uh, I invited uh, Tom to come and he and I became fast friends, a lot of the, um, interest in going beyond the old perspective on Paul, although Tom and I differ on, on a number of important issues, but a, a lot of things in common and interest in narrative, interest in reading Paul a little bit differently than he had often been read. So this, those two became quite good friends as well as influences. Um, you, you, before we were going uh, live, you and I were talking a little bit about some previous programs you've done and I also became friends with Stanley Hauerwas about the same time I went, went to St. Mary's. And uh, Stanley had a, has had a profound influence on me as, as well. So 
and among scholars, those three are probably the most influential. And again, narrative, Christology and ethics, all of them to a degree or another. Um, and then of course, Stanley with his strong influence on the church as a, as a distinctive body, which is also Richard's emphasis and Tom's emphasis as well. Um, yeah, so I've, I've actually written an article on Tom's ecclesiology in dialogue with Paul. Um, so anyhow, yeah, but those, those, three, those three have been some of the major influences. There are other people, of course. Yep, marvelous. Thank you for that now, Michael. And um, I want to look at some of your own work and tease out some of these wonderful themes then, if we might. So um, let's begin with cruciformity, Paul's narrative spirituality of the cross and participating in Christ, um, explorations in Paul's theology and spirituality. And um, I want to ask you, when it was first published in 2001, cruciformity broke new ground with a, a vision of Pauline spirituality that illumined what it meant to be a person or a community in Christ beginning with Paul's expressed desire to know nothing but Christ crucified. You showed how true spirituality is telling the story in both life and words of God's self-revelation in Jesus so that we might practice cruciformity. What does that mean then? And um, why is it so vital? Yeah. Um, I, I coined the term cruciformity to be the noun form of the word cruciform, which lots of people had used. Um, some people it is, I wouldn't say lots of people. Cruciform simply means cross shape. It's an architectural term for the way crosses were built to look like a cross, especially cathedrals, um, going way back to the middle ages at least. And I used that term and people use that term metaphorically for a life that somehow embodies or uh, takes on a, a cross-shaped way of being. Um, now, what, is, what does that mean to be, so conformity to the crucified Christ, it doesn't mean primarily suffering. What I describe in, in um, cruciformity is four virtues, if you will, or four aspects of cruciformity taken from the theological virtues, faith, hope, and love. So cruciform, cross-shaped faith or faithfulness, cross-shaped hope, cross-shaped love, and then I add power, cross-shaped power. So what does it mean for the, in a narrative way for us to not only see the cross as the source of our salvation, but as the shape of our salvation? And specifically for Paul, that has a lot to do with um, giving, acknowledging one's status, but not exploiting it for selfish means but looking out for the community, looking out for the good of others. And that embodies the, the narrative of Jesus. And, and then it becomes the narrative of Paul and the narrative that he wants his communities and all Christians to live out. That was essentially the argument of my PhD dissertation in conversation with the Stoic Epictetus. So already in the 80s, I was thinking these things. I didn't publish Cusiformity, which which is not my published dissertation. I didn't publish the, the book Cruciformity till 12 years after I finished my dissertation uh, for a number of reasons. But one reason is I wanted, I wanted the teaching of Paul to really shape the way I wrote about Paul in a, in a published way. Another practical reason, I was helping my wife raise three children and didn't have a whole lot of time to be an administrator and a teacher and a parent and also an author. Yeah. So yeah, that, that's that's... The, the narrative shape of Christian community, communal and, and personal existence in light of the cross is what is what cruciformity is all about. Mar marvelous. Thank you, Michael. And um, what have been some of the biggest misconceptions then about Paul and his writings that you've come across and um, maybe still persist today? Yeah, I think the probably the biggest misconception I think, well, there's a couple of big misperceptions of Paul. I'll start with an easy one, uh, that Paul was a misogynist. Um, I think Romans 16 puts that in, in clear perspective, that Paul was hardly someone who looked down on women or limited their roles. You know, the, 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 the difficult texts have to be read in light of the clear texts, and Romans 16 is one of them, Galatians 3.28. Uh, that's an easy one, I think, to dismiss. I think a more important one is that 
what persists is that Paul is primarily about getting people into a basic personal relationship with Jesus. If they, if they know the term, they call that justification. And that that's about all there is to Paul. And, and that's such a superficial, unfortunately superficial reading of Paul that um, I've spent most of my life for the last 20 plus years trying to dispel that notion. The Paul is primarily about participation and transformation, both of communities and of individuals. And justification is the is important, and it's the beginning or the, yeah, I guess we can say for now, the beginning of that process of transformation and participation, but it's only the beginning or or depending on how you define it, it is, if you define it robustly, you can see it's more than just the beginning. But anyhow, um, that narrow vision of justification, I think, is problematic. I think another really serious misreading of Paul is that somehow he is different, dramatically different from Jesus. So he gives us a different version of, of um, what it means to be a person in relationship with God, that he's invented a new religion or he's gone against the teaching of Jesus and uh, that's, I think that's completely off the mark as well. So there are a lot of misreadings of Paul in, in, in my opinion. Yep. Thank you, Michael. I think your work has done a good job in dispelling some of those myths, as you say. And, um, I want to ask you next. So, so something that Tom Wright actually, and Tom Holland, the historian, um, portrayed in the conversation they had for unbelievable, in line with your work, I think is the radical nature of Paul and his message and how he's changed everything to international law and our conceptions about justice and everything. Um, I want to ask you about his letters. So what makes Paul's letters immediately relevant to our contemporary Christian life? Hmm. Well, I think the primary reason is because Paul was writing for a set of communities that were called to be God's people in a distinctive way in um, the world, in the Roman Empire, in that case, in our own context, very different, but in some ways quite similar, depending on where one lives in the world. Um, and that there's a continuity, the people of God, the church um, is one. And we face the similar issues to what the earliest Christians faced. Uh, the, the, you mentioned that I hold the Raymond Brown share here at St. Mary's Seminary. Raymond Brown's most famous for his uh, work on John, the Gospel of John, but he also wrote an introduction to the New Testament. And in that introduction, he says, if you're only going to focus on one letter written by Paul, it shouldn't be Romans, it should be 1 Corinthians, because so many issues in 1 Corinthians are analogous to the issues we face today issues of church unity, issues of human sexuality, issues of spiritual gifts, issues of believing or denying in the resurrection of Jesus, um, marriage issues, you could go on and on. So I think Paul is very practical, but what makes him practical is his practice, his, his practical advice um, comes out of his deep theology, this deep connection to the power of the risen Jesus through the spirit, working out God's will and God's plan for the church and for the world. And um, that that never loses its relevance. It never loses its power. It never loses its um, insight for our own, our own context. So Paul, from my point of view, Paul just speaks right to our world. Marvelous. I wanna move on then to Apost Apostle of the Crucified Lord. A theological introduction to Paul in his letters and um, ask you what is the central importance of the resurrection to Paul and why are more metaphorical or mythical um, readings of the resurrection of the mark yeah well if I can if I can backtrack for a second we meant we're talking about cruciformity um, your uh, viewers and, and hearers might want to know that that book is coming out in a 20th anniversary edition this summer and I've written a fairly long um, afterward in the book. And one of the things that 
some people have criticized me for about that book and my work more generally is what is sometimes perceived to be a lack of emphasis on the resurrection. You know, cruciformity sounds like it's all about the cross. If you read that book carefully, I do talk quite a bit about the resurrection. And when you get to Apostle of the Crucified Lord, in the first edition, but especially in the second edition, I deliberately talk much um, more deeply and broadly about the, the importance of the resurrection. So I, a couple of years ago, I even coined a new term, resurrectional cruciformity. That is to say, cross-shaped existence that is imbued with the power of the resurrection and which is life-giving to both those who practice it and those who are affected by it. But to go back to your, to your question then, if there's no resurrection, as Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, let's eat, drink, and be merry for tomorrow we die. There's, in my view, there's no point in being a Christian if there is no resurrection, not only of Jesus, but also of us. Um, and this is all there is. Uh, as Yaroslav Pelikan, the great historical theologian said, if Jesus was raised from the dead, nothing else matters. If Jesus wasn't raised from the dead, nothing else matters. Um, so what does it mean more specifically? I've already alluded to one thing. The resurrection means that Jesus is alive. He's active in the church. He's active in the world through the spirit that brings that resurrection power, which is always cross-shaped, brings that resurrection power into the world. It also means that um, uh, our bodies matter and uh, they matter now, they matter in the future. As Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter six, what we do with our bodies with respect to human sexuality matters because these bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit. And one day God's going to raise them, not destroy them, but raise them, transform them, 1 Corinthians 15. So the, the body has uh, huge implications for how we conceive of our life now, our, our life to come, and how we conceive about whether um, uh, life matters at all, whether um, we should just carpe diem, or whether we ought to be living fully uh, alive for God in Christ Jesus. Yeah, thank you, Michael. I think tying some of those things together too, that um, I had thought Paul, I previously Paul had been sort of anti-marriage and different things like that. But whenever you do look at it in the historical context, I think with your work and like Father Raymond, Raymond Collins and people like that, you see a more complex picture and some of those difficult passages and everything are transfigured in a greater historical light and everything. So I do think people should be familiar with the likes of your work for addressing those misconceptions. And um, another one I want to ask you about is what did he have to say about justice in the church and transforming the surrounding culture, which I think comes across. Yeah. For some reason, that is a hot button topic <laughs> these days. Um, so I, I some years ago, I became convinced that Paul's language of justification needed to be taken seriously in its Hebrew background, its Jewish background, its um, linguistic background to mean and be associated with the word justice. Justification in English as in Hebrew and in Greek, is closely related to the word justice. And yet that was so much foreign to most discussion of, of justification that I knew, was aware of. And of course, historically, that I think has been true for a long time. Um, so I began poking around and looking at whether anybody else had, had made those connections. And of course, a few people had, including the uh, great Jimmy Dunn, who unfortunately passed away last year. But uh, I, I wrote an article on justification and justice in Paul with special reference to the Corinthian correspondence um, probably 10 years ago now. And then I turned that into a chapter in my book, Becoming the Gospel. And, and the argument of that chapter and the argument of the earlier article was when, when Paul talks about being a 
becoming a justified person and joining a community of justified individuals, he is also talking about a community that embodies the justice of God. As he says in 2 Corinthians 5, God made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf, that in him, Christ, we might become the righteousness or the justice of God. Uh, Richard Hayes, who we've mentioned a couple of times, has a, a great line in his book, Moral Vision of the New Testament, where he says, notice that Paul doesn't say that we might believe in the righteousness of God or that we might receive the righteousness of God, that we might become the righteousness of God um, or the justice of God. And those terms need to be defined in terms, and this is, I think, what gets people a little nervous. We need to define them biblically and how Paul would define them prophetically about caring for the widow and the orphan, about making sure that the, the hungry are, are fed and the, um, the naked are clothed and so forth. And, and to find that term biblically so that the first thing we're talking about is, is a way of life that embodies the prophetic call to, to that kind of justice. Then we can talk about what that means in terms of the way we interact in the world and the, what, what we strive for in the world, what our, our witness to the world is. Um, not starting with the presupposition that it's about a certain kind of social movement, certain kind of political party, but looking at it, as I said, biblically, and then seeing how that is to play out. Um, and that's something that requires conversation, requires discernment. But it seems to me that we can't avoid the reality that unless Jesus and Paul renounce their prophetic heritage, and I don't think they did, I think they embodied it, they, they welcomed it, um, and, and, unless that were to be the case, we can't ignore their practice of and their call for um, for justice. Yeah, marvelous. Thank you, Michael. And um, what are some of the ways then that this biblical understanding of justice contrasts with our dominant, I guess, secularist alternatives um, in this disembodied internet age? <laughs> yeah. Well, I think to go back to what I said a moment ago about um, the biblical definition of, of justice. Justice starts in scripture primarily with the concern for those who are um, in greatest need and those who don't have um, the wherewithal or the protection of uh, those who can provide for them the widow, the orphan, the alien, the stranger. I think we need to start there. Instead of starting with the question of rights, which is where many in the West, at least, begin their conversation of, of justice. Now, I'm not denying the importance of, of rights, but I think they have to be contextualized. And uh, so I would say that a biblical understanding of, of justice begins not with the question of rights, but with the question of responsibilities. Where do we have a responsibility? What kind of responsibilities do we have as, as the people of God? Um, and we might conclude that that, in, that includes protecting certain kinds of rights, but it doesn't begin with, with that question. Beginning with the question of rights autom almost automatically means that people are going to spend most of their time uh, asserting their own rights and the rights of others in a way that's not necessarily defined by the values or the vision of life that we find in scripture. Yep, thank you for that, Michael. And I think um, in line with what you said too, um, you can see that continuity from the old testament through to the new through paul and everything so even the late great rabbi sex um who talked about switching from focusing too much on rights to responsibilities and the importance of the covenant and uh, all different things like that i think is important and yeah. um in line with your work i want to ask you next about peace then and how we are to um pursue peace and what is paul's approach that we may learn from them 
Mm. Yeah. Sometimes it may not be true in Ireland, it may not be true in other parts of the world, but some people get labeled as peace and justice Christians, you know, and that this means something uh, from one point of view, very good, from another point of view, very bad, because you've, you've left behind spirituality or you've left behind evangelization, evangelism, whatever you call sharing the faith with others. Um, and again, this is un an unfortunate and unnecessary dichotomy. You have in the uh, scriptures this um, ongoing vision from Genesis to Revelation of people being in a state of shalom, of right relations with one another, with God, and with the non-human creation. And to me, I, I, would, I would call that a conservative understanding of Christianity in the sense that we're conserving what is throughout scripture. Um, if you want to call it liberal, I will happily, I don't like labels, but I, I will happily say, call it whatever you want. Let's just say this is from beginning to end, and it doesn't stop with the prophets and then, you know, leave Jesus and Paul in the dust, that, that Jesus and Paul are speaking words of peace. Paul says we have peace with God, but also he calls us to practice peace with one another and with our neighbors, to, to live in this state of, of shalom, that the, the church becomes a kind of um, community of, of shalom, of peace, in as a foretaste of, of God's coming kingdom. So as a result of that, um, if we see this dynamic relationship between, as you were saying very rightly, um, the prophetic tradition of covenant and of the benefits of covenant, how that gets carried out in the life teaching, death, resurrection of Jesus, and then implemented by the apostles narrated in Acts or by Paul in the, in the churches and, and other New Testament writers. I, I think that that's a consistent image of, of the church from uh, the people of God in, in the scriptures of Israel right through Jesus into um, the New Testament writings. So as a result, um, we need to make peace and justice biblically understood, even understood in terms of Paul, um, priorities for the way we, we live in the world. That includes a commitment to nonviolence. Um, it includes a commitment to reconciliation uh, where there's people who have been uh, fighting, whether literally or, or figuratively, um, that that's part of our witness in the world. And uh, some of us are called in, in more practical and specific ways. Others are called uh, to, to define it, um, to wrestle with it. But we're all called in one way or another, I think, to practice it as, to, as the church and as individual Christians. Yeah, thank God for that. And um, again, I, I think as co contrast serves for clarity sometimes, how does that differ with the modern secular humanist perspective about peace and how they, they go about pursuing peace, if that makes sense? Yeah, I, I think there are probably various different kinds of understandings of peace. Um, uh, even, even if you talk about pacifism, for instance, there's a, there are varieties of pacifism. Lots of people, John Howard Yoder, Howard Wass, others have written about that. Um, I think, though, in general, um, it's almost like the issue of justice. We need to go back to the prophets and the way they're interpreted by Jesus and Paul to see that, uh, A, First of all, that peace is this multi-dimensional um, reality, and it can't leave any of those three elements out. It has to involve humanity. It has to involve the non-human creation, but it also has to involve God. There is no peace when there's no, uh, because peace is a covenantal blessing. 
if the covenant is is completely flat, completely horizontal, if you will, it is not biblical. It's not full. It's not the fullness of life. So that to use the spatial imagery, peace like justice has to be both vertical and horizontal, involving our relationship with God as well as with our creation, the creation and with one another. I remember um, an incident probably about five or six years ago, and I was giving lectures in Canada. And I was talking about peace and justice in Romans. And during the question and answer session, uh, someone raised their hand and said, what you're describing sounds a lot like life in Canada. Uh, <laughs> people get along, they're friendly, they try to live in a green way, they, you know, on and on and on. And my response to that was, well, that's all well and good, but where's God in that picture? Uh, you know, there's no, there was no verticality in her description of, of life in Canada. Now, yeah. I'm not saying there are no Christians in Canada, there's no good Jews in Canada, don't misunderstand me. Um, I'm simply saying that, that that mishearing of what I was saying, at least I think it was a mishearing, is, is typical of how people are reductionistic, reductionistic about peace. So Christians can be reductionistic by saying, well, it's just peace with God, you know, peace between me and, and Jesus, if you will. Or perhaps I'll extend that. I, I want to get along with my family and the members of my church or my neighborhood and be at peace with them. But the, the peace that the Bible envisions is much bigger than that. Um, but we don't want to be reductionistic in, a, reductionistic in a secular way by saying peace is simply about tolerating everything and everybody and, and getting along um, or peace in a secular sense is, is peace with deterrence, you know, the old kind of Cold War mentality that we have to have lots of arms to, to keep people at bay and to, to keep the peace. Um, neither of those secular versions is the Christian version. Yeah, marvelous. Thank you for that, Michael. And um, I want to move on next to elements of biblical exegesis, a basic guide for students and ministers, which I think is most helpful. So I think, I think your hearers and, and uh, viewers need to know that uh, you've obviously read a lot of what I've written, and I, I have to express my appreciation for that. <laughs> we have a wide-ranging conversation here. <laughs> Thank you, Michael. And um, you've presented a very straightforward approach to the complex task of biblical exegesis and break down the, uh, the task into different distinct elements. So what are um, some of the, the elements that you lay out and how did you come to this selection? Well, I'll start with the second part of your question. I had really good teachers of exegesis in my undergraduate and um, what we call graduate education, postgraduate education, I think you say in the UK. I had really, really good teachers who, who taught me good methods. And I learned from them. I, I don't say that I replicated them, but I learned uh, from them. And I think the biggest thing I learned from them, two biggest things were to pay attention to context and for me now, contexts, plural, are important. And also to pay attention to detail. Um, so those two things, the forest and the trees, if you will, you know, the big picture and the details. But the elements of exegesis that I talk about are actually seven in number, good biblical number. Mm -hmm. um, whether you're just thinking about doing a close engagement with a text or writing one up. I talk about um, introdu introduction or overview, kind of looking at after you've done all your work, what is it? how would you introduce this to somebody if you had 30 seconds to, to talk about it? But then to look very carefully at context, the big context, literary context, the historical context or the social situation, if you will. Sometimes we can't know that, we can't know much about the writer of Genesis. We can't sometimes know much about a particular Psalm. It's a lot easier with Paul's writings than it is with, or prophetic writings, than it is sometimes with other parts of the, of the scriptures. So um, more recently, I've broadened that context to include canonical context. How does this text fit within the particular 
relationships with other parts of scripture and our own context. Where are you, the writer or the reader or the interpreter, where are you reading scripture from? Are you in Mumbai? Are you in Zimbabwe? Um, are you in uh, downtown Baltimore? Are you in suburban Los Angeles, California? And how does that affect? How, do, how does context affect the text that you're interpreting and how does it affect you as an interpreter? But back to the text itself, I think it's very important to look at structure. When I was a young exegete many, many years ago, I came to the conclusion that once you understood the structure of a text, you were more than halfway there to really grasping the intent or at least the um, impact uh, of that text. Very, then going to the detail and looking at it very, a text very carefully. But all, all through the process, thinking theologically about this. How does my theological context, and that includes for Christians, our long history and our, our beliefs, our, our basic creeds, our basic beliefs, how does this text fit into that? How does it help me better understand the doctrine of um, God or, or the mission of God in the world? So asking these kinds of theological questions as we're reading the text, and then at the very end, reflecting deliberately theologically on, on this text so that analysis is never an end in itself. It's always with the goal of engaging the text for our own life and our own mission in the world. So um, those are some of the elements of exegesis that I talk about um, in a book that's now in its third edition that has sold something like 65,000 copies. Um, I actually found a copy of that book in a pastor's home in the rainforest of Cameroon about 12 years ago. So that, that's a funny story in itself. So you never know where your, where your books are going to show up in this world these days. Yeah. <laughs> the people of Cameroon will be glad, I'm sure. <laughs> and um, I want to ask you then, in line with that, I think you've really laid it out brilliantly there, but um, maybe for those who don't know, what is the central difference between exegesis and eisegesis and mm. how can we best avoid the latter? Yeah. Well, the... The main word, root word behind both those words, exegesis and ace or eisegesis, is hegeomai. It's the Greek verb for um, leading or guiding. So do we want to guide out of the text? That's exegesis. Or do we want to read into the text? That's eisegesis or eisegesis. And some people would say that all exegesis is really eisegesis. We're always... <laughs> reading our own perspectives, our own views, our own wishes into the text. I don't, I'm not that cynical. I do believe we all bring our own agendas, we all bring our own perspectives, lenses and blindfolds to the text. And we need to be aware of that. But we want to let the text as much as possible convey to us what it would have conveyed in its original context as best we can. Sometimes that's very, very difficult. Sometimes it's a lot easier. So we want to give a credible reading of the text that's not superimposing our own perspective on it. Um, so that's the difference between the two. Is it easy? No. But that's where looking at the big picture and the details in a kind of back and forth can help. Um, uh, that is most helpful. Thank you, Michael. Sure. Mm -hmm. I want to move on next again to um, cruciformity and inhabiting the cruciform God, kenosis, justification, and theosis in Paul's narrative soteriology. And um, in that study of Paul's soteriology, you argue that cruciformity is about theoformity. And um, I want to ask what the, what the Christian tradition is called theosis or participation in the life of God. Can you tell us a bit about theosis and um why maybe has it been underemphasized and how can we recover its central place? Yes, thank you. Well, um, after I wrote Cruciformity, which means cross-shaped existence or Christ-shaped existence, some people pre pre prefer the term Christoformity. Uh, I think Cruciformity is a better term for Paul, though Christoformity is a fine term more generally theologically. <laughs> 
Um, I was working through texts and thinking about these things, and I, and I came to realize that Paul believed that when we are reformed into the image of Christ, and specifically Christ crucified, paradoxically, we are being reformed into the image of God, because Christ was the image of God. So that's how I moved from cruciformity to theoformity, God-shapedness. Oh, then I got, I was getting a little scared, to be quite honest with you, because um, that seemed like a major shift. And so I had coined the term theoformity, and then I was writing this essay and then working on the book. And I said, you know, there's got to be a term for this in the Christian tradition. I can't be making this up. <laughs> And I literally don't think I had ever heard, or at least it hadn't registered if I did hear it, the term theosis, which means um, basically becoming godlike. And uh, once I learned about that term, I was able to redo what I was working on and use the term theosis primarily as the meaning of, of theoformity. God-shapedness, if you will. I think, I mean, I. by the time I learned that word, I had been through eight years of theological education, had never heard it, or at least didn't, like I said, didn't register. Very good theological education, I might add. Uh, largely in a Reformed context, and the Reformed tradition has at least in some forms, had some hesitation about that word uh, and about that concept. So I think why people are either ignorant of or sometimes fearful of the word and its concept and the concept associated with it is that it sounds like people are becoming divine, becoming gods. And it's very important to realize that Theosis or, or deification is another word. Some people distinguish them. Some people make them synonymous or divinization. I prefer the term theosis. I think we can use them all synonymously, but again, not everybody does. Um, we need to think of it as a theme in the Christian tradition and not a hard and fast doctrine. So some people don't like it because they think it blurs the distinction between creature and creator. Well, it has never done that in the Christian tradition. And Proponents of theosis dramatically, emphatically say, we don't intend to blur that line. Another reason people don't like it or haven't heard of it is they often associate it simply with Eastern Orthodoxy, uh, with the Orthodox tradition, not realizing that in the Western tradition, people like Augustine and even Luther and Calvin um, have either similar words, similar concepts, or in some cases, the exact same words and, and similar concepts. Uh, union with Christ, uh, even justification being uh, an aspect of union with Christ for Luther and Calvin, for instance. So um, the fear of, of blurring the distinction, the very idea that we could become like God, I think, um, worries some people. When I first started using the term, I had a fellow Methodist, and, and Methodists, by the way, have had a lot of interaction and dialogue with the uh, Orthodox tradition, because in the Wesleyan tradition, we talk about perfection, not my favorite word, but it, it, it implies a process of moving closer and closer to God, and that's in many ways what theosis is about. Um, I remember a Methodist New Testament scholar reacting very strongly, saying, we don't need anybody talking or thinking they're going to become more and more like God, because we in the West, especially in America, already think we're God. So there's that kind of political fear, if you will. Um, so there, there are a lot of, uh, of reasons for it. But I do believe that more and more theologians biblical scholars are coming to terms with 
A, at least a notion of transformative participation, and B, a careful use of words like either theosis or Christosis or deification. Um, I'm thinking of one uh, important New Testament scholar whose, whose work is called Christosis, Ben Blackwell. I'm thinking of a, um, an Australian, uh, New Zealand, excuse me, uh, theologian who strong advocate of deification, although he does not like the word theosis. So, um, and he's in the reformed tradition. So I think things are changing. Yep, thank you for that. And I know too that even um, a few people I've had on like um, Dr. Michael McClayman and Father Jerry McDermott, they have even shown how theosis has been a part of Jonathan Edwards and these people that um, might not be considered to have a uh, focused on theosis. Yes, yes, yeah. So <laughs> I want to ask of, you lots of interesting work going on in the whole area. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I want to ask you next then about um, the balance between kenosis, justification, and theosis all together, and what are some of the ways we might strike the balance and incorporate all those elements similarly to how you mentioned before respecting the creation and all the different levels of the one time. Does that make sense? <laughs> I think so. Um, but let me let me try and answer and then you can tell me if I answered the question or not. <laughs> uh, what I was trying to do in, in inhabiting the cruciform God was to suggest that in some sense, kenosis, self-giving or self-emptying is at the heart of the nature of God. In the Trinity, there's this ongoing self-giving love and that takes a particular form in the incarnation and, de and death of Jesus, um, a particular form of, of love for humanity. Um, and it is that canonic self-emptying, self-giving incarnation and death of Jesus that um, defines, if you will, um, God-likeness. So I, I have a line in, in, I think it's in the book, if not, it's in a later article, that says, um, deification, is Christification, which is humanization. We become most fully human when we become like Christ. And ironically or paradoxically, when we become like Christ in his self-giving love, we are becoming like God who is self-giving love. Um, so that, that connection of deification, Christification, humanization is extremely important to my, my ongoing work. And, and I think it's important for, for community and individual Christian living. Um, what does that have to do with justification? Well, if, if I'm reading Paul rightly, justification has to do, yes, with a divine pronouncement. That's the traditional Protestant understanding. But when God speaks, something happens. The creation happens, or in this case, the new creation happens. So to, to be justified is to be the recipient of a divine grace, a divine word, divine action that is inseparable from that divine being of self-giving love. So that when we uh, are justified, we, as Paul says in Galatians 2, we die and rise with Christ. We participate in his self-giving love that canonic love, that kenosis. Um, and in, in so doing, we the process of theosis begins because that kenosis is the revelation of God in God's self. Um, so it's, it's a complicated interaction. So I don't know that I would use the word balance as if they need to be balanced, but integration. And that's what I was trying to do in that book was to integrate all of them. Some people would say very successfully. Some people would say problematically. <laughs> We're getting ourselves into 
into um, problematic territory. But I do think that more people think it's a good thing than a bad thing. Thank you for that, Michael. That, that was the, the sort of answer I was hoping for. Okay. <laughs> so um, how then do we take some of those lessons on board and live in that integrated way and apply that to our daily lives? And what does that look like, I guess? Mm -hmm. Well, I, I, I want to go back to words because not everybody likes some of those words. I'm, I'm fine if people don't like the word theosis or deification or... Um, but if we go back to that, what I consider to be the root concepts of transformation and participation or transformative participation, um, a text like Romans 12, one and two, I beseech you brothers and sisters by the mercies of God to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, um, to have your minds renewed uh, by the renewing of your mind so that you can you know, demonstrate in daily life the, the, the will of God. And that's addressed to a community, the, the Roman believers in the various house churches in Rome. Um, that to me, what it means is that each day, every Christian and every Christian community should wake up thinking, okay, today is a day of transformative participation in the life of God. What is that going to mean? What am I going to think about today and how am I going to think about it Christianly? What am I going to do today and how am I going to do that Christianly? Whether it's talking to my neighbor about the football match or it's talking to my neighbor about the need for you know, taking care of the, the widow across the street whose who's, um, you know, husband died two weeks ago and, and now Nobody's around to provide food. How do we think about our daily life as an ongoing participation in the life of God so that we're more Christian tomorrow than we are today? Um, our churches are, are always not just stagnating and thinking we're celebrating, you know, if we're sacramentally oriented, we're, we're a community that celebrates the sacraments and we're going to do that the same way today, tomorrow, and forever. Not that, I, not that I'm looking for change for the sake of change, but how are we going to grow as communities and as individuals um, to think, to act, to feel even uh, more Christianly day by day? That to me is the goal of, of Christian existence corporately and individually. And um, to me, you, you begin by, in, in a sense, offering the day in prayer to God with some kind of vision of the cross before me um, that I'm going to pray to be able to live out this, this life um, resur of resurrectional cruciformity. Yeah, that's beautiful. Thank you, Michael. And um, something that I think is really important and interesting in your work is that you take lessons from all over the world. And as you spoke about different contexts and how that affects us and everything before, I want to ask you, what is the importance of um, refocusing on the world transforming character of uh, the gospel and Paul's work and everything? And how do we um, do that without falling into, I think, maybe a trap that... Um, we we'll say the Marxist categories of conflict theory, where we're perceiving everything as oppressor, oppressed, and things like that. And how do we go beyond that? Well, I think the first thing to say is we, we who are Christians in the West really need to learn from our brothers and sisters in other parts of the world. Um, and I've been trying to do that dramatic, uh, not dramatic is the wrong word, um, not dramatically, but explicitly, de definitively, or, or deliberately for about the last 12, 15 years. Um, and I believe that what we see when we see Christians in other parts of the world, particularly the global south, we see Christians having been liberated literally from the oppression of colonialism and 
at the point where they need to develop indigenous um, theological perspectives, not that they're starting it now, but they've been doing that for a long time, especially if they've been colonized, and for them to teach us how to um, avoid the false dichotomies that have arisen in the West. I recently gave a lecture on this very topic in South Africa. I've just written an article about it for, uh, for a forthcoming book. The West is, is prone to dichotomization, um, body versus spirit, uh, spirituality versus justice, um, theological readings of scripture versus uh, post-colonial readings of scripture. All these either ors, it ought to be both ands. And um, to me, once we, once we balance, to go back to a word you used a little while ago, Mark, once we balance those two th binaries, the binary things, uh, and bring them back in together in integration and, and conversation, we can avoid both the dichotomies of the Western theological tradition and the reductionism that I talked about earlier of the secular tradition. So that um, I, I haven't read it carefully. I don't know if it was a, both a text and a video, but recently Tom Wright came out with a, an, L, an entity of some kind that's been talked about in the, in the uh, online world where we as Christians re need to realize that we are the original um, multi-ethnic, multi-racial community. That's the vision of Paul. That's the vision of the New Testament generally. It's the vision of the book of Revelation. So how do we guarantee, if you will, that that kind of vision remain Christian um, we can learn from secular readings. We can learn even from Marxist readings of, of the world, but ultimately they need to all be um, uh, tested by and filtered through the lens of the Christian message, the lens of the prophets, the cross and resurrection. We take care of the poor and not because Marx said so, but because Jesus said so, you know? Yeah. Thank you for that, uh, Michael. Yeah, that makes sense. And um, just moving on from that to Revelation, actually, yeah. and um, your book, Reading Revelation Responsibly, on civil worship and witness and following a lamb into the new creation. So in rescuing the apocalypse from those who either completely misinterpret or completely ignore it, you've given us this guide to read in Revelation in a more responsible way and a theological engagement with the text itself. So what are some of the biggest misconceptions about Revelation for starters? Uh, how, much time, <laughs> how much time do we have? <laughs> Well, I mean, the biggest misconceptions are pretty easy. One is that it is a, a blow by blow, fairly literal prediction of the unfolding of church history and especially the unfolding of the end times, the very end of days. Um, and corollary to that is then once you believe that, uh, that you then try to connect particular scenes in the book of Revelation with particular historical moments, whether past or especially present or in the imminent future. I can remember even in my own church years ago, uh, the first Gulf War, a woman came into my adult class and sat down and said, well, now I know the end is here because it's in the book of Revelation. Um, oil spills uh, off the coast of the United States. People say, you know, this is the end. This is the prediction of, of Revelation chapter six or, or whatever. Yep. Um, so the, the, the flip side of that is the failure to read Revelation for what it is, which is um, an apocalyptic text of the first century, full of symbolism, full of metaphor, to see, speak a prophetic word to the church in the first century that can also speak to the church in the 21st century. 
not by virtue of its predictions, but by virtue of its images, its direct address, its prophetic calling, its um, depictions of the church, its depictions of worship. So I like to think of, of the book of Revelation as a series of theological political cartoons that are exaggerated but profoundly insightful and um, we need to take them very, very seriously. And, and in that sense, take them literally, but not in the sense of predicting X and Y and Z, but literal in the more generic sense of taking them um, at the, uh, uh, for what they originally were intended to be. So. Yep. Thank you for that, Michael. And um, in line with that, how might we come to I guess, teach and preach revelation so that has this more powerful and helpful impact on individuals and the church and how they live their lives? I think part of it is that many people have not been exposed to good writing on the book of Revelation. So they, they've picked up something they find in a bookshop, uh, whether my generation, it was Hal Lindsey, the previous generation to this one, it was uh, Tim LaHaye and the Left Behind series, which is still influential, yeah. influential in all kinds of churches, including Catholic churches. Um, uh, so people need to read, people in seminary and, and pastors and, and lay people need to read better, better books. Um, I'm happy if they read mine, but there are lots of other good ones. I I recommend highly and I require my students to read a very spiritual reading of uh, Revelation by Eugene Peterson called um, uh, Reversed Thunder. Beautiful, beautiful treatment of Revelation. Or anything by um, David De Silva here in the United States or Ian Boxall in the UK. He has a new commentary out on Revelation. I'm sorry, Ian Paul, sorry. Ian Paul, Ian Boxall, who used to be in the UK, has a wonderful commentary on Revelation. He's now here at Catholic University in Washington, D.C., uh, just down the road from where I live, actually. Mm -hmm. and, um, and there are lots of other good books that take most of the good books on Revelation see a political edge to it. Mine's a little edgier than others, but... Uh, Revelation was a political tract of, of kinds, a theopolitical tract. It was definitely a theological work, but it was meant to challenge Christians not to give in to the demands of um, the Roman Empire economically, religiously, and otherwise. Yep. Thank you for that. And um, then what are some of the key connections to the rest of Scripture? And are there any little... Um, Literary, literary connections that you find particularly interesting? Or... Do you mean um, with respect to Revelation or just more generally? With respect to Revelation? Oh, yes. <laughs> well, yeah, Revelation is, uh, somebody recently described it as, um, I think, a, a riff on the entire Old Testament or something like that. Um, as some people will know, there there's really almost no direct quotations of the Old Testament in Revelation, but there are thousands of allusions. And um, so I, and in some ways, the book of Revelation is, is a kind of pastish, a kind of quilt of so many scriptural books, Ezekiel, Daniel, um, even parts of the Gospels, uh, the Mark 13, for instance, um, visions of worship in places like Isaiah uh, chapter 6, um, visions of God's people, visions of new creation from the latter part of Isaiah 65 and 66. I mean, so there's, there's so many thematic creations. Uh, revelations like the, with Genesis, like the, the two bookends of the Bible, you know, from creation to new creation. So in, in one sense, everything is flowing toward this 
this book. And if we don't get it right, we're going to, in some ways, get the rest of scripture wrong. Um, this, is, this is where scripture is moving. If that's the case, it seems like it's important to understand where scripture is moving toward. It's not there accidentally, it's there deliberately, purposely. Most important, thank you, Michael. And um, another work of yours, Abide and Go, Missional Theosis in the Gospel of John. I'd love to look at that. Uh, the Gospel of John seems to be both the spiritual gospel and the gospel that pr promotes Christian mission. So, however, some people seem to have found John to be a product of a sectarian community, one of the criticisms of Harawas, I think, and um, promoting a narrow view of Christian mission and one which ad advocates neither love of neighbor nor love of enemy, whereas you show otherwise. Why has it been so so misunderstood for starters? I, I wonder how misunderstood it has been. Um, it takes a, a few scholars, perhaps, of a certain bent <laughs> to, to misunderstand it. Uh, I, I find when I, when I teach about the book of, of John, uh, a lot of people already get it. Um, don't get it fully, but already, already get it. They're, they understand the misinterpretation, but they'd never get there on their own. <laughs> I just yeah, I just yeah. gave a short I just gave a short 20 minute presentation on this topic to a class uh, of all lay people last week, and um, they were surprised at the misinterpretation, but understood it and were happy to hear me uh, argue against it. So I, I do believe that there are. Um, because John has been understood as the spiritual gospel, it is possible to turn that into a way of reading it that either downplays or even denigrates the materiality of Jesus um, or the materiality and the reality of life in Christ on the one hand. On the other hand, it's also possible, once you get past the uh, obvious stories like the Samaritan woman, which everybody understands to be kind of a, a missional text, once you get beyond that and Jesus starts using all these I am sayings and only talks in the second half of the, of the gospel to his disciples and he says, um, you know, um, he washes the feet of his disciples, he washes uh, the feet of his friends, he dies for his friends, he talks to his friends only. It, it can begin to sound like the only thing that matters is believing in Jesus and um, that's all we want to that's all we want to do and, and call people to do. And so one of the things I've tried to do is to broaden our understanding of mission in the Gospel of John, that it's not in conflict with the um, synoptic Jesus. As a matter of fact, I wrote an article some years ago uh, called The End of the Johannine Jesus. We need to stop using that language to say Jesus and John is somehow different from um, the Jesus that's portrayed by Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And uh, uh, Abide and Go, the title of that book, tries to say in three words what I think the whole of the gospel is saying, which is the, the mission of Jesus is to call people into a very deep spiritual life in him with God the Father, with the paraclete, but that is a life of sharing in the love and the light and the life of God in order to share that love and light and life with the rest of the world. Um, so abide the spiritual in dwelling with Jesus, go, that paradoxically, to go out with, uh, with that sense of abiding, so, and with that reality of abiding. So it's paradoxical, abide and go, deliberately, I think it's exactly what the Gospel of John uh, says. And um, yeah, so back to that word theosis, right? Yeah. Missional theosis. We, we become like God by participating in the life and mission of God. Yeah, that's beautiful. Thank you, Michael.
And um, you might be glad to know I've got one more book I want to just look at with you today. So The Death of the Messiah and the Birth of the New Covenant, a not-so-new model of the atonement. So <laughs> in this book, you ask why there is no theory or model of the atonement called the New Covenant model, since this understanding is likely the earliest in the Christian tradition going back to Christ himself. And um, why have most models of the atonement overemphasized the I guess, penultimate purposes of Jesus's death and the mechanics of the atonement? Um, that's a very good question. I'm not sure I can tell you why that has happened. I can certainly tell you that, in my opinion, it has happened. So just to clarify a little bit, what I argue in the book is that most models of the atonement, whether it's some form of substitution or some form of... Um, Christus Victor, Christ Conquering, uh, and there's a variety of others, but the, most of them, if not all of them, are looking at, as you said, the word, the mechanics of the atonement. How did the death of Jesus somehow fix things? And how do we explain that? So, for instance, penal substitution. God had to punish somebody. Instead of punishing us, God punished the son who substituted and received the wrath of God in our place. And so whether one agrees with, I, I do think there's a substitu substitutionary aspect of Jesus' death. Um, I don't think it's penal, but I do think there's a substitutionary dimension to it. But it seems to me that that doesn't really answer the question why. It answers the how question, but not the why question. Why did God do this? What is it that God is um, wanting to save us from and for? And if we simply focus on the mechanics of what might have been accomplished on the cross, we, we can miss the ultimate purpose. And so what the model that I propose is that the purpose of the cross in all of its dimensions, substitution, yes, victory, yes, model to be imitated, yes, liberation, yes. All of these are kind of, if you will, under the greater umbrella of the purpose of Jesus' death which was to birth the new covenant or to birth the community of the new covenant. Now that book title was, came out of a lecture that I gave as my inaugural lecture uh, as the Raymond Brown professor, because Raymond Brown had written a book called The Death of the Messiah, which was a study of the four gospels accounts of Jesus' death. So I was riffing on that book in both the original essay and, and, and lecture and in the, uh, in the book title, the death of the Messiah, to what purpose? To create this, this new community. Uh, yeah, amazing, thank you, Michael. And um, how did, then does this view of life and practice of how we might live in the new covenant contrast with older church models, if we might call it that, and again, the dominant secularist culture, which we find ourselves in now? Hmm. Well, I think one thing that's very important is we maintain a balance, again, between what the West tends to dichotomize. Is salvation about the individual or is it about the community? And the answer is yes. <laughs> um, is, is the Christian mission about getting people to believe in Jesus or helping um, um, bring about reconciliation among hostile parties? And the answer is yes. <laughs> so practically speaking, I think it impacts, especially in the West, how we get away, have to get away from a very individualistic, privatistic model of being Christian. And that becomes very reductionistic as well. Well, what really matters, I believe in Jesus. So um, you know, when I die, I'll go to heaven. You know, that's an extreme, but not unheard of interpretation. 
And that's, that's an ecumenical misinterpretation, Catholic, Protestant, Orthodox, non-denominational. Um, so how do we get away from that? We get away from that by seeing this balanced approach, this idea of a new covenant, a people of the new covenant, and that we live into that and, and need one another. Um, I think I hinted at the beginning of our conversation. I'm still in contact with and see regularly people that I've known for almost half a century. And I don't mean just see on a friendly basis. We engage in spiritual conversation and Bible study together. And I think that uh, we do that so that we can live out our discipleship more faithfully, hold one another, at least to some degree, accountable, and, um, and do that in a way that is balanced between all these different binary concerns that we've talked about today. So we need one another. We need communities. Uh, we need to be sacramental, but also charismatic. We need to be evangelical, but also contemplative. Richard Foster, the great spiritual writer, did a, a book on these a long, you know, many years ago saying, there, there are specialties and there should be, there's the contemplative, there's the activist, but ultimately a balanced community of Christians and a balanced Christian life needs, in my opinion, needs something of all of these. Yeah, amen. <laughs> Thank you for that, Michael. And um, again, just before we go, you've mentioned a few things forthcoming there. Would you like to remind us about those or is there anything else that you're working on presently that you'd like to tell us about? Sure, thanks for asking. Um, I have just submitted the manuscript to Erdman's of a theological and pastoral commentary on Romans. So that's been edited and it's being typeset. It won't officially be out, I think, till probably January. Um, I already mentioned the 20th anniversary edition of, of Cruciformity, which has a foreword by the younger American scholar Nijay Gupta, so that that book gets passed on to the next generation, so to speak. Um, I've mentioned a couple of essays here and there. I am also uh, working on two um, collections of essays that will be out in a year or so. One is a book of essays on non-Pauline writings in the New Testament. Revelation and others. And the other is a book of essays on Paul that have been um, not come out in book form previously. So oh, lots, okay. of, lots going on. Yeah, I look forward to all of them. And um, thank you so much for joining me today, Michael. It's been a real pleasure to speak with you. Thank you. And if I could just say one other word of thanks and, and promotion, let me mention a book that I didn't write a book called Cruciform Scripture, which came out in January. It's a book about my work, which even if it wasn't about my work, I would highly promote it. It's a wonderful collection of essays. Tom Wright is in there. Richard Hayes is in there. Lots of other good people. Amazing. And um, well-deserved. Thank you, Michael, and God bless you. Thank you so much, Mark. I've enjoyed being with you.